Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to uh, welcome you all here. This is the uh, third annual um, symposium that we have for the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Excellence, and um, it's going to be a wonderful event. I'm looking forward to the presentations. Um, so it's really been uh, wonderful to uh, live through the uh, birth of this uh, new institute and um, to see how it's taken hold in such rapid time at the University of Chicago. Uh, I think that that's um, a tribute to um, the Buxbaum. So John is over there and uh, Kay, who uh, initiated the idea, and uh, Jackie Buxbaum. So maybe the three of you can put up your hands and so that people can recognize you and thank you. Uh, and then obviously uh, the role that Mark has played, both in initiating the idea and in <coughs> implementing <coughs> the institute. Um, and uh, then I think we have to also play tribute to all of you, faculty, students, residents, uh, who've really uh, been responsible for the enormous growth that has happened in the last three years. And I think it is a big tribute to the University of Chicago, to the culture, uh, that this simple idea, which is that um, promoting a uh, effective and collegial and constructive relationship between doctors and their patients is a central thing to what we do and how we can institutionalize that and the fact that people have embraced it with such enthusiasm uh, is really uh, very, very encouraging uh, and gratifying. So um, I'm delighted that uh, we're all here today. I'd like to also just say how pleased I am um, that Wendy Levinson uh, is going to be giving the keynote address. So many of you know Wendy, who was a faculty member here for many years, very, very distinguished uh, general internist. And I can't actually think of anyone who is uh, more appropriate to talk about uh, an, uh, a very positive doctor-patient relationship and communication between doctors and their patients uh, than Wendy. So Mark's going to say more about her, but we're just delighted that you're here, Wendy. So thank you all for coming. Kenneth, thank you very much. Uh, I also want to recognize um, Kay Buxbaum, uh, the founder of the Buxbaum Institute, and uh, John and, and Jackie, uh, John and Jackie. Um, uh, yes, you let, let, I think again, I agree. Uh, the Buxbaum Institute was founded about two and a half years ago in um, uh, September of 2011 uh, with a foundational endowment gift uh, from the Matthew and Carolyn Buxbaum Family Foundation. Um, and uh, the mission, the mission of the uh, Buxbaum Institute is shown on this first slide. Um, the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Excellence was created to improve patient care, strengthen the doctor-patient relationship, and improve communication and decision-making through research and teaching programs focused on medical students, junior faculty, and master clinicians. Um, and, and we hope, going forward, uh, also on residents. Um, that, that, that's something that we intend to implement. Um, since uh, the Institute was founded two and a half years ago, we have been looking at various ways to fulfill uh, our mission. Um, and some of the highlights of what we've done uh, in, in that time have included appointing more than 90 faculty, medical students, and undergraduate students as scholars of the Institute. Um, th this includes uh, a distinguished group of four master clinicians, um, and you'll hear from the four master clinicians uh, after Dr. Levinson's keynote address. Um, Dr. Ross Milner, uh, Dr. Mike Bishop, uh, Dr. Um, um, Tandell, forgive me for a moment, uh, and, uh, um, uh, and, and Dr. Derschel. Um, and, and they will be speaking at about from two to three. Uh, uh, we also have developed various programs through the Institute, including a pilot grant program, uh, a variety of programs focused on medical students, um, and, uh, and even some programs working with the undergraduate students across uh, the campus. Um, we've developed collaborations, with, particularly with the uh, 
Schwartz Center in Boston and with the Gold Foundation in New Jersey, two of the organizations which have the longest and most distinguished track record um, in uh, medical humanism and compassion for patients. In, in fact, in, in October, October 30, 31, and November 1, uh, we will co-sponsor with those two organizations, the Schwartz Center and the Gold Foundation, a conference uh, in, in Atlanta on compassionate patient and family-centered care through interprofessional education. Uh, I know some of you are, have heard about that conference and have been encouraged to um, submit abstracts uh, for presentation there. Um, with this background, uh, I'd like to turn to our keynote speaker today, Dr. Wendy Levinson. Um, what Wendy is, um, uh, is not only a, a distinguished colleague, but is a dear, dear friend. And um, uh, I have to tell you that for the um, many years that Wendy lived and worked here in Chicago, um, she and her family and our family shared a common wall. That's, that's how close we were. We were in townhouses, and um, the difference was 57, uh, 5805 and 5807, and um, it was wonderful having Wendy as a neighbor. Uh, Wendy uh, Levinson is the Sir John and Lady Eaton Professor and Chair of the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto. Um, uh, Toronto's Department of Medicine, I should tell you, is probably the largest or one of the largest such departments uh, in North America. Um, how many faculty in the department? 1,700 full-time and 1,400 part-time faculty in the Department of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Levinson is nationally and internationally known uh, in the field of doctor-patient communication, uh, has written uh, major papers on the disclosure of medical errors to patients. Um, uh, Dr. Levinson has led efforts to educate and engage residents and faculty in questions like patient safety and quality improvement. Um, she's led many innovative projects to improve the organization of care, including one called Bridges, Building Bridges to Integrate Care, an initiative to develop and test new models of care, linking hospitals, primary care clinics, and community services, aiming to provide comprehensive care to people with complex chronic illnesses. Very recently, uh, Wendy has been leading a program called Choosing Widely, Wisely Canada. Uh, some of you have heard of the Choosing Wisely program here in the U.S., uh, but Choosing Wisely Canada is a campaign to help physicians and patients begin conversations about the overuse of tests and procedures and to support physician efforts to help make smart and effective choices that ensure high quality of care. Uh, Wendy's topic today uh, is uh, talking with patients when less is more. Please join me in welcoming Wendy Levinson back to the University of Chicago. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's, uh, it's really a treat to be here. Um, although the box bombs have heard from everyone how important the center is, I, I just have to say I've worked in the field of doctor-patient communication my whole career. And uh, I just think it's really a special thing to have someone recognize how central the doctor-patient relationship is. Because often we revere technology and fancy new things. And the heart of it is really about the doctor-patient relationship. And it's really wonderful that you've recognized that and helped them to get this going. So, so um, really, I want to spend some time talking about um, a transition that I think is happening terrific, in uh, North American medicine, um, shifting from a philosophy we have in society about more is better to recognizing that sometimes in medicine, more is not better. And um, you know, I think that physicians for many years have believed that our job is to take care of the patient in front of us, and only the patient in front of us, one at a time. And typically, we believe that managing a group of patients is really, uh, and the resources of the group, is not our job. It's 
our go job to do everything for each patient one at a time. And I'm gonna talk about the responsibilities of a physician to both the individual patients and what I believe is at the same time the management of scarce resources and the tension that exists between these two. And what I'd like to do is discuss a bit of what I see as the evolution in the tension between the caring for the individual patient and for the, a group or the management of scarce resources over time. So to start a history like that, let's see. I have to put up the Bible of clinical ethics. I have to tell you, I've, I had to work hard to find this original copy, copy was, which was published in 1982. So Mark and his colleagues at that time talked about how you make clinical ethical decisions. And there is one chapter in the book on, quote, external factors um, affecting ethical decisions. And in this section, Mark and his co-authors said that the cost of medical care constitutes a major problem for the American economy and society. They said, quote, cost of care in terms of the federal budget as a percentage of the gross domestic product is a problem of public policy. As a policy problem, it is a matter for policy makers, not clinicians. By the way, at that time, the percentage of the gross domestic product being spent in the US on healthcare was 11%. We're now at almost 18%. Rationing medical care, they argued, was the domain of policy makers who could set up rules like the eligibility for renal dialysis resources. And those criteria, they argued, would be used in the hands of clinicians. But overall, in this 1982 edition, Mark, there was very little discussion of the physician's role in considering the use of finite resources. Approximately one page of the 200-page book was dedicated to talking about the cost of care, and the bottom line was that finite resources was really not our job. This was called rationing at the bedside, something that doctors didn't want to do. Then, in the mid-1990s, we saw the rise of managed care. Basically, managed care was a system to integrate the financing and delivery of medical care through contracts with physicians and hospitals. There were, in there were incentives, particularly for primary care physicians, to limit referrals to specialists, limit some of the high-cost services, and see more patients in a set period of time. Financial incentives were put in place by managed care organizations in order to change physicians' ordering practices. But the movement was not physician-led, and organized medicine disliked it. This is a slide from an article by Grumbach in the New England Journal in 1998, looking at um, the percentage of primary care physicians and their um, how they perceived um, whether managed care incentives compromised the clinical care that physicians provided. And what you see is that uh, the darker bars are the, the percentage of physicians that felt that the pressure compromised care. And primary care doctors felt that the pressures to limit referrals, to see more patients in a set period of time, and to limit what they told patients about what kind of fancy tests might be appropriate or appropriate for their care, um, was uh, many primary care doctors felt that it, it compromised care. In fact, in this slide, in this next slide, um, what the, the, the um, study showed, this was a survey of primary care doctors in the US, is that if you were um, a, a physician who limited referrals, um, you were likely with an odds ratio of 2.5 to cons think that this was if you had these kind of incentives, it was compromising care. If you were, had productivity, that's in the middle column incentives, you were likely to think it was limp, it compromising the quality of care. And if you had incentives to improve the quality of care or patient satisfaction with care, those physicians did not have an increased odds ratio of thinking it compromised care. So incentives actually did influence what doctors did at that time 
it influenced what they thought they were, how effective they were being. And um, most doctors really didn't like it. Um, this study showed that managed care grossly decreased physician satisfaction with the practice of medicine. And I just remember, I was a primary care doctor during the managed care era in Portland, Oregon. And I remember having to get on the phone and talk to administrators to beg them for another day of hospital care for a patient who was critically ill and how much of my time I felt I spent doing what administrators in a managed care system was telling me I needed to do rather than spending time with my patients. So I think, in fact, managed care was a failed experiment. It was one in which um, organizations, not doctors, led a conversation about how we were going to limit costs. And they had a very time, hard time actually changing physicians' practice. And ultimately, I think it was a failure. So that was in the late 90s. So then I'd say that this was a next, uh, I think, landmark um, piece of work. And uh, Holly and I were um, involved with the ABIM during that time when they created, and, and Kenneth was uh, on the board, when the ABIM, along with the ACP, the American College of Physicians, and the European Society of Internal Medicine, created the Charter on Medical Professionalism, looking at what it meant in that, uh, at this time in the early uh, part of the, the decade of 2002 to uh, be a medical professional and what our responsibilities were. And the charter is just a charter with words, and it doesn't make it a living document. But it put on the radar screen, I think in a very clear way, that physicians had a series of responsibilities, including one to social justice. Not only the traditional ones of patient's welfare first and the autonomy of the patient to make choices, but a different one, which was our commitment to, the, to social justice. And the charter had 10 responsibilities, many of which we'd heard about for many years. I mean, things about being competent, patient confidentiality, honesty with patients, we knew about. But it put two on the radar screen that were little talked about at that time, include improve, including improving the quality of care. And I think we've made good progress on that since, uh, since that time. But it also put in place a commitment to the just distribution of resources. So again, another time uh, from Mark's book, then through managed care, this charter is starting to articulate the physicians have a responsibility, not just to the patient in front of us, but also to the social well-being of society and to the just distribution of resources. So um, I think that that sort of set the stage for what I'm going to tell you is how I think this is hugely changing now in our present day situation. And I think for the first time in my practice lifetime, in a meaningful way, physicians are starting to balance the responsibility to the individual patient and the greater need, the finite use of resources. But they're balancing it, I think, in a way that is working for physicians. And I'll, I'll tell you why I think that. So this is Don Berwick's slide that some of you have probably seen. Don Berwick, who was the head of Medicare Medicaid and um, started the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And this slide he fondly refers to as the wedges of waste. And what this slide shows you is the increasing percentage of the gross domestic product, um, which rises, whatever we think the exact rate of increase is. And on this axis is what he refers to as the wedges of waste. And by this, he, he says that we waste money on many things. And waste, he would say, are things we do which don't add value to the healthcare system. They just add cost. So they don't improve things for the patient, but they make it more expensive. And he talks about things we all know about, the failures of care delivery. That's that we know that if we prevented diabetic complications, that we wouldn't have problems later and that would be less costly. Um, the failures of care coordination, that's something I've been very concerned about, because I don't know about your place, but our primary care doctors never know what the specialists did, who don't know what happened in the ER. And so when in doubt, just repeat the test. Um, and over-treatment, and I would call it over-diagnosis, over-treatment, 
uh, things we do that just do not add value for the patient. And the estimates from the Institute of Medicine is that this wedge of waste might account for up to 30% of the dollars we spend in healthcare which is a staggering amount of money. Now, it hasn't been replicated that often to be sure that this is an accurate number. In Canada, for example, we don't have that number. But whatever it is, every single one of us who's a student, a resident, or a practicing doctor know that there are things that we do that don't add value for patients. And so uh, that led to um, the number of studies that have happened over the last period of time, this is an excellent study by Deb Kornstein that's a systematic review that was pub published in the Archives of Internal Medicine, or JAMA Internal Medicine, that looks at a variety of different conditions. This is just a snippet, coronary or angiogram, revascularization, endoscopies, and shows you the number of studies that have been published. And in the far column, the rates of overuse, which are based on the RAND uh, appropriateness measure that's one of the sort of gold standards for assessing appropriateness of care. And what you see in that column is that there's a range, but there's a lot of studies that show a very significant percentage of overuse of pretty common tests and treatments that we use all the time. Look at bronchodilators on the bottom with a range of overuse in those studies of 30 uh, to uh, 80%. So there's just no question um, that we have developed uh, patterns of practice over time for a variety of reasons where we think more is better and we do more than is needed and we do things that don't add value. And I think it's really because we do live in this more, partly that we live in a more is better society. I mean, just think of all the things we like bigger and bigger of cars and TV sets and, you know, Big Macs and drinks and, you know, and patients come into the office thinking that, that if they don't get a test, if they don't get a prescription, they didn't get care. We have in our society equated more is better and brought it into the medical environment. And we have all been in the situation, if we practice medicine, that a patient will come in and say, my next door neighbor had this uh, headache and she had a brain tumor and I need that CAT scan. Or every specialty have people that, you know, patients that come in. I can see people nodding. Because we do um, have this as our study. But I would remind us, it's, it's doctors and other healthcare professionals that shape patients' expectation. They weren't, you know, they didn't intuitively think more is better. We, we taught them that bigger technologies and fancier things were better. Um, you live and breathe in the US in an environment where there are ads all over TV trying to get, encouraging patients to get new and fancy tests. We don't have those in Canada, but we have a semi-permeable membrane and we get American TV. So Canadians think that more is better too in healthcare. And uh, also they think if they can't get it in Canada, they can buy it in the States. So, um, but doctors, it's, it's us, mainly doctors, but all health professionals. This is Ezekiel Emanuel, who talks about how we really, it's, it's us that determine the cost of care. 80% um, of the cost of care is, uh, comes from doctors' test ordering and treatments. We are in charge of how much we spend in healthcare because we make decisions every moment, every day about little things. You know, we'll see you back next week. We'll see you back next month. We're, we're going to hospitalize you. All the decisions we make about tests and treatments, technologies. And I would just say we're enamored with technology. You know, we live in a profession where fancy things are tend to be better and we like them. Now, sometimes they're breakthroughs, like we talked about last night at dinner. But often, they're just incrementally better, but a lot more expensive. Or maybe they're not better at all. And certainly, we make huge decisions about drugs which even in Canada, where we don't have drug coverage, many patients just don't uh, fill our prescriptions. We just don't find out that they don't fill our prescriptions. Um, but they don't fill them because they're too expensive. It's one of the biggest reasons for noncompliance. So I, I always say, you know, we didn't get up in the morning thinking, how can I go to work and spend, you know, waste a bunch of money? Um, that's not really... So how patients say to me all the time when I talk about this, so how could this happen? Like, why are we doing all these things that aren't needed? Doesn't seem reasonable. But you know, we, there are lots of reasons. I alluded to this. The patients may want it. 
new tests are good, new, new things. It's better to get a test than do nothing. You know, it's actually quite hard to explain to patients in a doctor-patient relationship why they don't need something. It's a lot easier if you're running late to check off the box that says order that test than it is to sit down and have a deeper conversation with patients. We've had some interest in teaching this. One of the family doctor groups runs a workshop called Don't Just Do Something, Stand There. Because um, it takes some unlearning to kind of change these practice patterns. Um, referring doctors want it. This is something really important. You know, I think often what happens, primary care doctors say, well, I order that test because I can't get the patient into the vascular surgeon unless I've set, done the ultrasound. I can't get the person into the urologist without that test. And referring doctors think, well, the family doctor sent the patient to me expecting I do this. If I don't do it, they will think I'm not being thorough. I mean, we create some of these um, expectations between us about you know, ref um, what we expect from one another. So we want to please our referring doctors. We fear litigation. Um, this is true in Canada too, in addition to here, but certainly one of the big challenges for us in choosing wisely was the emergency room physicians because they're quite worried about litigation if they miss something. And, um, and so there's lots of ordering to um, make sure that we're ruling everything out, in the, especially in the year. But we all have this in our specialties. They're misaligned financial incentives. We live and breathe in a world where sometimes ordering those things that are not necessary are directly related to bottom line for the physician or the healthcare system. And um, that is a strong incentive. But I would say that one of the most important ones that we don't talk about is uh, we learn practice patterns. We've always done it that way. When I see a patient with X, I always order Y. And we get these patterns of practice that we've learned in training, and they, they hang in pretty hard. It's hard to change those patterns. And Holly knows we have some really interesting data from the American Board of Internal Medicine that show that where you trained influences your practice patterns in the future. And if I have a moment, I'll show you some of that. So, you know. There are lots of reasons. It's not just one reason why the answer to a patient saying, well, why would doctors order these unnecessary things? It's a multitude of factors that I think all of us can relate to. So Ezekiel Emanuel basically says, we physicians are the only healthcare, are the only people who can get healthcare costs under control. And I like this other philosopher. Somebody just has to do something, and it's just incredibly pathetic that it has to be us. And that's Jerry Garcia. But it really does have to be us. I would tell you that if we, the people in this room, if we as physicians don't lead a conversation to change this more is better, it will be others who are leading it for us. There is no question about that. Whether it's because of the gross domestic product, Holly and I work a lot with Glenn Hackbarth, who's been uh, the chair of MedPAC, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission. If we don't change this dialogue with doctors and patients, others will. So we have to step forward. And I am really excited about this campaign of Choosing Wisely. How many, I bet most of you have heard of it. How many people have heard about Choosing Wisely? OK, so almost everyone in the room. But I'll give you a little bit of the flavor of Choosing Wisely. Holly, this won't be new to you. But it's a campaign to help physicians and patients engage in conversations about the overuse of tests and treatments and support patients to make good choices. Now, that sounds simple. I can tell you the ABIM Foundation spent a couple of years asking the question, how can we engage in a real conversation about overuse without the backlash of rationing, death panels, you're killing granny. You know how much that, red, that kind of polarizing conversation has in the past not allowed real conversation about this. And so we spent a long time doing studies, focus groups, and trying to figure out how can we open this dialogue. And the words choosing wisely were chosen carefully to try to find a language that could um, open this discussion in a real way. And we were never trying to say the, that you shouldn't do these things. But many of the things we do, routine, that we've learned over time, we need to reconsider.
And the strategy that was so successful, and I'm going to tell you why I think it's been successful, though there's not a lot of data yet, is that at the beginning, we had to twist the arm of nine brave societies. And I say that because they didn't know how this would play with the media. Would, would their society look really bad? Would their members, like radiologists or cardiologists, think that they were selling them out by putting things on a list that they shouldn't do? But in fact, after the first nine came in, we, there are now more than, more than 60 medical societies in the US who, are in, who have engaged in choosing wisely. Not all of them are posted yet. Some of them are working on it. And each of those societies created a list of five things in their specialty for which there was excellent evidence of overuse, waste, and harm. They were free to determine how they did that as long as the process was transparent and posted. We wanted it to be evidence-based. There had to be tests in their specialty. We didn't want people to say, well, if those family doctors wouldn't order this, it would be OK. It had to be something they controlled. They had to be frequent. And uh, like I said, they had to be evidence-based. So each of the 60 societies have lists that look like this that many of you, I'm sure, have seen. It was quite hard to get them to start with don't. Um, I can tell you it was harder in Canada, because Canadian doctors are, you know, Canadians are very polite. They don't like to say don't. Um, we had to change some of the language in Canada. Um, but anyhow, all of them say don't obtain uh, screening EKG testing or stress testing in people who are asymptomatic. Don't obtain imaging studies in, for back pain when they're not red flags present. They each have a little bit of a, uh, a rationale under them. And then they continue with how they did it and how they created the lists and the references for it. So they're, they're each like that. Now, especially coming back to the, the goal of the Buxbaum Institute, um, you may not have seen these, but on the website also, there are instructive videotapes on how to have this difficult conversation. I would say, as someone who's worked in communication, this is what I would call a higher level, sophisticated communication procedure. Since we like procedures, this is a communication procedure. Because um, it's really actually quite difficult to tell patients who've come in with a set of expectations um, why they don't need something. In reality, most patients trust their physician. And if we explain it to them, they are given the reassurance they need. But it does take a little bit of time. There's no question that this is not um, something that you can do in a, in a minute. It takes a couple of minutes. It may save time later by not having um, return visits for people who are anxious. But it does take time. So we created these videotapes that are in the, uh, on the website. This is one from the ACP on a, the woman asking for the CT scan of her headache. And you can see down the side that it goes, you, gets you through communication steps, eliciting concerns, expressing empathy, reassurance, providing recommendations. And so these are actually quite instructive if you want to see examples of how you can have a successful conversation in a relatively efficient period of time. And there are a variety of them for different specialties. So then I think another thing that um, was really great about this campaign is that we partnered with um, Consumer Report. And um, Consumer Report created a series of um, patient brochures, which are actually, I don't know how many of you, how many have used one of these? OK, so not many of you. If you haven't used one, they're super. Um, they are. There, the overall series is called When to Say Woe to Your Doctor. Now, that's not a very Canadian thing. We had to change that. Um, but each one of them, for different conditions, they all look like this. And so this is the imaging for low back pain. And they explain um, why you don't need imaging tests, that they don't help you get better factor, faster. They explain that they pose risks. And this is something I think really important about the campaign. Patients don't understand. They may understand direct risks. So you could have an antibiotic reaction, a, even a serious reaction to a drug. But most people don't understand false positives. So they don't understand the concept that if you have a test, and then you have to get another test, and then you get a needle biopsy, and then you get a complication, that that original test did not help you. In fact, it could harm you. So these do actually a really super job of explaining uh, risks from tests, both direct and 
false positives. They have a section on wasting money. Uh, remember that bankruptcy, the number and cause of bankruptcy in the United States is healthcare. And increasingly, as employers shift costs to patients, I think patients are quite concerned about how much that test you just ordered is going to ask them. I'll tell you that I still pay for some of my kids' health care in the States. All three of my daughters live here. They have high deductible insurance. And when one of them recently had an ultrasound because of an ovary that didn't quite feel right, it was very expensive. She, you know, so I think these are um, real things and increasingly issues for patients about what the costs will be of tests and whether they're really needed. So these are excellent materials. And I'd say this is an incredibly important part of what's shifting is that we are starting to engage patients in a meaningful way in this dialogue, not just doctors. It's a bilateral conversation, and we have both doctors and patients involved in um, learning about that more is not better. So this is our campaign in Canada. It's in English and in French, choisir avec soin. That's kind of a nice way in French because soin means care, but it also means caring. So it has a good connotation. We've translated all of this into English and French. But I wanted to put this slide up, not just because we've done it in Canada. We actually kind of replicated the American process and had our own Canadian societies redo the lists. Um, notably, um, because we could learn from the American lists, the Canadian lists are a little bolder. You may have seen the Meredith Rosenthal New England Journal article, which criticized the choosing wisely for doctors not really picking things that were in their pocketbook. Um, so I think having seen that and having had the American experience, some of the Canadian societies were willing to be a little bit more bold in the selection of items that were on their list. But also I wanted to mention to you, it's become kind of a worldwide effort. So um, there, I'm convening a meeting in Amsterdam in June with the, some, the following countries who are doing Choosing Wisely in one way or another, Japan, Italy, Denmark, the Netherlands, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and Germany, um, and the US and Canada. And I can tell you, and Holly can tell you, we never dreamt when we started Choosing Wisely that it would catch on this way. And um, I think it's catching on for a, a number of reasons that I want to share with you. And I think the reason that Choosing Wisely is catching on um, differently compared to other efforts to deal with this tension between caring for the patient in front of us and the resources of um, our greater system is, is physician-led. It is not payers telling doctors thou shalt not order MRIs. It's doctors themselves articulating when things are unnecessary. And, it, and the lists are not saying you should never order this. They're saying order it when it's appropriate. But think about it, because many things we do routinely, preoperative screening tests, EKG, EKG stress tests, um, et cetera, are maybe not necessary. So it is taking physicians out of the dilemma because I think we are doing the best for the individual patient in front of us, avoiding things that are unnecessary or harmful, but it is not asking us to ration needed tests. It is not like managed care that's putting external restrictions. It's not saying that we shouldn't order an, 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 uh, an expensive test if it's needed. It's saying, Think about it with your patients. Talk about it with your patients. Explain why not all tests are needed or why a test may even be harmful. And so I think it has tons of t face validity for us. It's really, I would say, the first time in my career I see physicians really engaging seriously in this conversation. And the, the physician-led nature of it with our own societies doing these evidence-based lists, I think has been a breakthrough in our thinking about this tension between the individual and the greater, the greater good. And the second reason I think it's so um, successful in the beginning, and we don't have a lot of data yet on utilization, is it really is a bilateral thing. It's engaging patients and the public in a serious conversation. 
And I think Consumer Report has helped, but also I've neglected to mention, I mean, Consumer Report got all kinds of groups like AARP, trade unions, um, teachers organizations involved so that they were sending this out to their members and engaging their members in this conversation. So there were both sides, not just physician education, but real patient education going on. And secondly, as I alluded to before, patients are worried about out-of-pocket costs um, increasingly, and I think they will be increasingly. And lastly, I think, um, or maybe not lastly, but additionally, um, it's, it's we're starting to be explicit about harm. You know, I think we have really neglected. I've listened to, I would say, thousands of interactions between doctors and patients that I audio taped, and actually one of the one of your faculty was a student with me when she was in first year, and uh, we listened to audio tapes. And really, doctors hardly ever bring up the risk. They just are silent on risk. So patients don't know about the risks of things, and they think that getting it is good and not getting it is bad. So finally, we are talking more about the, the harms that can result for, from unnecessary tests and treatments. So I think we have a public campaign to do. You know, um, we're starting to play with ideas like this. You know more isn't always better. This guy didn't know that um, when he got his sunburn. Um, and we've got to find ways to take this message about more is better and change it um, in the medical environment. So I just want to, before I end, talk a moment about medical education as this is what you do and what I do. And I think residents and students have the same kinds of pressures. I know Vinnie Aurora and David Meltzer are very involved in this, and they're at SGIM right now. But so you know, but they have some other pressures that I think we can change. So residents want to show us they're thorough. A good resident has ordered everything, so when the attending comes in the next day, they go, I thought of A through Z, and I ordered every test to rule them all out. And you know. Those are, un, you know, they, they, they do that because they want to show it. They think their attendings want that. But if you say to the resident, why did they order it? They say, well, the attending expects me to order it. And, we've, and if you ask the attending, why did you get that test? They say, well, I didn't think it was needed, but the resident had ordered it. So, you know, we do a little bit of this. Um, and so you might think about one person, one attending told me starts his rotations now by saying, I know that you've always been reported, rewarded for thinking of everything. On this rotation with me, you're going to be re rewarded for only doing necessary things and being able to justify why you ordered them. And that's a change in culture. Um, residents lack feedback about their test ordering procedure, their practices. I would say we all do. When did you last get feedback about whether you order more MRIs um, in a certain condition than your colleagues? Feedback is very powerful. Residents do preemptive ordering. If I order that CT scan tonight, maybe I can save a bed day tomorrow and get the patient home a little sooner. So even if we don't know if we need it, let's just get it. And it's just like us. This is the way they're taught. I mean, one of uh, my head of cardiology says every single time he's on the wards, the residents have ordered sophisticated cardiac imaging. As soon as he gets in the next day to round on the patient, they've already had them all. And it's just because we bake it in. It becomes, it's invisible to us. So you may think about all the ways that you could reverse this. I just want to um, kind of make a couple closing comments. This is a diagram from an article that um, I wrote uh, with some colleagues at the ABIM Foundation. And really, what it, we are saying in this article about professionalism is that professionalism is behaviors that occur at the physician-patient relationship. But those are embedded in interactions with teams, in practice settings, and the external environment. And all of these things influence our ability to act professionally. If we work in a practice setting that encourages us to be productive and see a zillion patients or order a lot of tests because they're lucrative for the, the healthcare system, that puts pressure on our ability to do the right thing. But we also have a responsibility to influence the system in which we work. If we work in environments that are driving the wrong incentives, one of the things we can do is speak up and try to change the environments we work in to make them 
facilitate and enable the best in the doctor-patient relationship. So we have both sets of responsibilities, the ones that occur with the, in the room with the patient and a responsibility to express our professionalism by making the system better. And I think this whole concept of the use of finite resources is this. We can do the right thing with our patients and we can influence the system in which we're working. And that's what I think Choosing Wisely and the societies are starting to do. So this is just to say, this is not a journey that's going to happen overnight. This is a culture change. This is a culture change. And culture changes don't happen overnight. You just have to think about the whole patient safety movement, which started with the Institute of Medicine's early reports on crossing the quality chasm. And we're 10 or 15 years down the road until we're really starting to implement patient safety. And the whole concept of doing the right thing and not overdoing things that are necessary is, is going to be a journey also. So I will stop there. I, I think that I've tried to um, kind of share with you my overview of this tension between um, the individual doing what's best for the patient and this tension we feel to do what's right with the limited resources. I would end by saying it really is the first time in my career that I've seen this shift. And what I think is so great is that physicians are leading this dialogue. It is only us that are in the exam room with patients. It's only us that can know when these things are needed and when they're not. And, and we are in the best position to educate our patients about that more is not always better. So I will stop there. I really am curious and interested to hear your reactions, your reflections. And um, I thank you, really thank you for the opportunity to come to the Buxbaum Institute and your symposium and share some of my thinking about this. Thank you guys. Okay. <laughs> um, so issues of cost are conspicuously left out, I'm sure, for political reasons and other reasons. But it, as you pointed out, as a percentage of the GDP, it's very high. And nothing seems, although it, the cost of healthcare has gone down a little bit. Nothing seems to be changing that. So what is the uh, view of, at some time or other, incorporating uh, that, which, as you point out, affects many patients' ability to pay and their economic status and so on? Yeah, so it's a great question. I mean, uh, I want to answer it in two parts. First to say, I think if, the, if physicians or patients think this is purely about lowering costs, they don't trust it. Because um, in Canada, for sure, we, we did a lot of focus groups. And if the patients, when they heard about choosing wisely, they said, is this the government doing this? Is this a payer? Because if it is, we won't trust it. So you know, I think there's this delicate balance. And with media, we really walked a fine line. We did not want the media to spin it as a rationing exercise, because we thought it would undermine the success of the campaign. On the other hand, as Vinny and David would tell you, uh, there's a growing interest in um, starting to have more transparency about cost. Hopkins, for example, did a study that was published in, uh, I think, JAMA recently, where they um, showed the cost of tests and treatments when doctors ordered them and then had a control group that didn't. And when they did show them, they decreased costs by about, I think, 8%. That, costs and tests ordered um, compared to the control group. So I think there's growing interest in greater tr cost transparency at the point of care. But it's a bit tricky, because if it's all portrayed as cost, um, it won't be trusted. And we're really choosing wisely is not telling people not to order expensive things. It's just not to order them when they're not needed. But I think we have to bring the cost in, too. So thank you, Wendy. That was a terrific talk. So I have a related question, and I understand that the fact that it's physician-driven is a very powerful thing. But physicians obviously make the decisions of what to do, but it's the payers that actually pay the bills. So at some point, if the system is going to work, one has to kind of bring the physicians together with the payers. And so I just wondered how you think that's ultimately going to happen, because, um, well, anyway, you understand the question. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, payers are mainly trying to get good, 
good um, efficiencies also. Um, it's not in their best interest to have unneeded tests, really. I mean, there are some. There, you know, we're in a funny transition period, right? Because in some situations, ordering expensive tests brings the system more money. Um, people refer to it as a time with a foot in two boats. Because we've been in this fee-for-service boat where more does generate more revenue, but we're moving into accountable care organizations and other systems of payment where more will not be better. And we are in a funny transition period. But I think it's in the greater system, and most payers know that we're going to the let's be rational boat. It's just that we got to get there, and there's some pain in between as this payment system, system shifts. So I think in the short run, there's going to be uh, some difficulty if, when the systems are geared to uh, maximize test ordering and revenue from it. But in the long run, I think everyone knows we're headed to another system that's based on efficiencies. And there, the doctors and the payers are going to be aligned if they're doing the right things. Charlie, uh, is this my gun? OK. Yeah. Hi, John Elverdy from Surgery. Uh, enjoyed your talk very much. Thank you uh, for coming. Um, I wonder how you might, uh, if you might comment on how technology, specifically web-based technology, universal electronic medical record, transparency, uh, online running rates of, uh, of different uh, computational algorithms for decision making might change this. You know, there's a Time article called, uh, uh, the cover story was, uh, Can Google Solve Death? And the idea, you know, is that, you know, imagine a world in which uh, both patient uh, and physician can go to a website and say, so I have pain in my left breast and there's a mass on ultrasound and you can put in, it'll say, here are your choices. And today, up till day, the accumulative data is 80% of people chose A and 80% of doctors chose A and 30% chose, you know, or 10% chose B, et cetera. And that, you know, sort of like Microsoft Word spell check, you become a better spell checker because you're constantly being reminded about how to spell things properly. And now you actually have the groupthink, the consensus, and it can change one way or the other as information changes. So I, I think it's a great point. I mean, in some ways, this is like telling you about the pre-test and post-test likelihood of disease by um, giving you this information at the point of care. Um, I think there's a lot of experimentation going on, as you know. Cedar sinai um, which is supposed to be two and a half times more expensive than Min Minnesota, um, has really taken this on. And so they've embedded 120 choosing wisely recommendations in their electronic medical order entry. So if you go to order an MRI for low back pain, the recommendation pops up. So uh, I, I think that this, I completely agree with you. I think we're going to move much more in the direction of the world giving us this kind of information. So we're not ordering it kind of with doctor autonomy, but doctor informed autonomy. You know, uh, so I agree with you. Thanks, Wendy. It's a great talk. I, I'm wondering about a middle ground as we're having these conversations because there's a a distinctly grassroots, grassroots democratized flavor to how it's approached right now. And then there's the risk of things getting out of hand and over-regulated if, uh, if uh, this turns into another set of pay for performance measures or whatnot. And, and one thing that uh, I'd like you to comment on is something that we're planning for the upcoming year here, which is actually to support the departments in terms of the department quality chiefs, so physician-led, to identify elements from choosing wisely specific to their practices and then to support them centrally with the patient education piece, the embeds into the electronic medical record. We're trying to find that balance for fear. We don't want to turn it into some percentage that's hit because some of these tests are appropriate. But at the same time, I think we all have a sense here of wanting to accelerate this and really help all the faculty, not just the folks who come to this meeting, to, to really have a chance to dig in. Yeah. Can you maybe comment on that? So, um, you know, we've been doing the same at our place, getting each division to pick one thing in the Choosing Wisely menu that they think is important and relevant to them and try to mobilize some energy. But you know, I, I'd say the thing is, it's a culture change, right? So how do you measure a culture change? I think you have to think about physician attitudes, resident attitudes, um, patient attitudes, and utilization. 
So I, I worry a little bit when we reduce it to saying, well, we're going to measure how many CTs for headache are ordered or how many ANAs are ordered in rheumatology lab, that it's very reductionistic and doesn't really um, you know, capture it. I think a better measure would be how often do you as attendings raise these issue on rounds? How often do the residents say, I didn't order the MRI because I didn't think it was necessary because I think it wouldn't add anything. Here's the reason I did that. Like, so I guess I'm saying uh, think broadly about what it would mean to implement this in an academic medical center. And maybe it's not just the measuring the specific test because I think that's too narrow a view. Uh, Wendy, thank you very much. Uh, the, the choosing wisely is obviously a fab fabulous step forward, and I think everything you said about having physician uh, input is, is critically important and all the rest. But let me, let me be a little provocative and over the long run and suggest that maybe we're dealing with a halfway technology here. Let's stipulate that we have perfect knowledge, perfect data, and that data were in included in every single clinical decision that was made wisely. Will we have enough money in the system to afford everything that the data suggests would be helpful for everybody for whom it could be helpful? <laughs> or are we going to eventually have to choose rationing? Yeah. Well, that's every country in the world is asking that question. So since we can't know the answer, let's at least get halfway. <laughs> you know, I mean, if we can take what we're doing and make it more rational, then I think we um, can assess you know, whether we need anything else. I mean, in the end, societies will need to make these decisions. 18% of the GMP is pretty high. In Canada, we're at 11.5%. Um, but in Ontario, we spend 50% of the revenue dollars of the Ontario government, which is half of Canada, on health care. 50? 5-0 of the Ontario um, dollars that are spent on, on their budget, the Ontario budget. It's online, actually. So, you know, that's like, wow. We are, how are we going to pay for schools for our kids? And, you know, um, so, but at least if physicians start this and we get patients to work with us, we can be more rational because, you know, we, every one of us knows that there are things in our day we do that are just like, kind of crazy. Why do we do that? Residents love this in our place. I just cannot even tell you how much our medical students and residents are invested. We have two first-year med students that have taken the entire University of Toronto curriculum, and they've looked at every single place where there are problem-based learning cases and lectures where choosing wisely recommendations could be embedded. And they email the professor the night before and say, I see you're giving a talk on um, low back pain, or you see you're giving the rheumatology talk tomorrow. Here are three choosing wisely recommendations. Would you mind bringing them up? And so our medical students know all about this. They're bringing it up with their attendings now and saying, hey, do you really think we should order that test? So like, it is it's definitely a midway. Also, I have to say, our residents like to do quality improvement projects on these topics. So. We found that it's really great because our chief residents and some of our senior residents, they see the crazy things we do, like um, all the urine, urine cultures that we order. Here's a little example. You know how many urine cultures we order that we do nothing about? So they let the urine cultures be ordered in one of the hospitals. They sent back a note to the attending that said, if you want the result of the urine culture you ordered, call us. Nobody called. And then they, f they f followed up all the patients. Nobody got sick. So they stopped doing these. Like, you know, all of those urine cultures that we've ordered for years and years, how many times have they influenced your judgment because they're really patients with a foley in and they're asymptomatic? So there's so many things out there like that that the residents go, finally, we could stop ordering these stupid tests. Laura? It was really a beautiful talk and a very compelling argument, so I want to thank you. 
I come from the perspective of psychiatry where the vast majority of people living with mental illness don't get adequate care at all. Yeah. And so I'm wondering if you could, and I know there are other underserved populations that matter to others of us here. Um, so the ideal would be if we could you know, preserve resources that then maybe would be distributed to patients that I care for. That'd be great. Um, but the cynic in me is wondering if we're, we don't need to address the paradoxical impact of even less care for the already yeah. underserved. So it's a really important point. We still have tons of under inappropriate underuse. So remember back about 15 years ago when Beth McGlynn did studies in all kinds of conditions, diabetes, all kinds of chronic disease, and her work consistently suggested that we order what was needed about 50% of the time. So those that got hemoglobin A1Cs. So now those numbers in a recent systematic review are closer to 75 to 80%. We have made progress on underuse. So it's still a problem. It's not done. Yeah. Will this be an important part of the conversation around choosing wisely? No, no, and I'll tell you why. Okay. <laughs> because as Holly will tell you in that room, we knew that if we mixed the message of underuse and overuse, we wouldn't make progress on the overuse issue. It's too confusing. If you do a public campaign and you say, sometimes we should be doing more of that, sometimes we should be doing less of that, like, you, you can't have a clear campaign. And we felt this had to be a public campaign in addition to a doctor campaign. So we made the decision based on focus group research and thought, a lot of thought that we were not going to commingle these messages. It, it's true, the issue you're raising, I have concerns about it. And it's particularly true in underserved and marginalized populations. But we didn't think we could make progress on the overuse issue if we commingled it with the underuse issue. And so, and I think that was the right decision because it's got to have a clear public message. Thank you so much. It's a wonderful comment.